a lot about the dynamic of, of how to do really sound quality research and how to commit to a long-term project uh, through the, the uh, SCAS RTP program. Um, and uh, so beyond, beyond that, uh, this person is the Curator of Herpetology and the Director of the Urban Nature Research Center at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. His focus in research is on sort of the natural history, evolution, and conservation of reptiles and amphibians. Uh, he also uh, has an appreciation and uh, for community involvement in research. Uh, and I think that this has sort of led to a lot of his work being uh, kind of dedicated to urban ecology, looking at sort of the, the natural history and how urbanization is affecting the distribution of reptiles and amphibians uh, within urban environments. Um, he was also recently elected to the board of directors of the Southern California Academy of Science and has mentored two other students in the SCAS RTP program. Uh, and then I'm, I'm the third with my pond turtle project. Uh, in a, he's published in many different journals, uh, peer-reviewed journals, and is also a co-author on the award-winning book, Wild LA, Explore the Amazing Nature in and Around Los Angeles. I highly recommend getting a copy. It's a great book. Um, and today he's going to be presenting his talk titled, Is Community Science the Next Revolution in Conservation, Ecology, and Behavior Research? So without further ado, get ready to rumble, and please welcome me in joining Dr. Greg Pauley. Wow, thanks, Michael. That was a lot of uh, a lot of excitement there. Um, it's so much fun for me to get interviewed or to get introduced um, by you, um, as somebody that you know is going through the SCAS Junior Research Training Program. And also, it's like an especially great night to be doing it because you're also at this point where you're sort of jumping off to your next steps in your um, your own research and academic career. So this is especially fun. Thanks so much for joining us all the way from Georgia. I know it's a lot later there. Um, so. Uh, yeah, get some sleep and you know do great in your interview tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here um, to kick off this talk. Um, so yeah, as Michael mentioned, um, I'm the curator of herpetology and the director of the Urban Nature Research Center at the Natural History Museum. And um, today I'm talking about um, the various ways that community science can be used in you know a lot of different types of biodiversity research. And, and this term that I use here of saying, you know, is it the next revolution um, in these various fields? I wanna be clear that I'm not using the word revolution as hyperbole. I truly mean that community science has the um, opportunity to truly revolutionize the way that we do research in a variety of different fields, um, you know, across sort of natural history, ecology, evolution, biodiversity, et cetera. Um, and so I use the word revolution in the same way that we can think about things like, you know, polymerase chain reaction and DNA sequencing, revolutionizing ecology behavior and evolution research. I, I truly think that um, it's, it's on par with that kind of level of, of change um, in the way we approach research questions. And that's my goal today is really to convince you of that. And I'm going to do it in sort of three parts. We're going to have a talk about sort of conservation uses, talk about eco ecological uses, and talk about animal behavior uses. Um, so just to make sure that we're all on the same page, like what am I talking about when I'm talking about community science? Um, we use that term. Others might be more familiar with the term citizen science. We prefer community science at the Natural History Museum because we think it's a much more inclusive term. Um, the definition that we use is really the definition that was coined by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. They um, developed what I would argue is the world's most successful community science project, that's eBird. And the definition that they use is simply projects in which volunteers partner with scientists to answer real world questions. And so that's the definition that I'm gonna be using um, today as we talk about community science. Okay, so as I said, the talk today is really gonna be in three parts. Um, and the first part is gonna be talking about the ways in which community science is revolutionizing conservation research. And the example that I'm gonna be giving is I'm gonna be talking about using community science to document invasive species, um, and ideally to document them early enough where you then might have the opportunity to do something about the, those species getting established before they might be able to have ecological or economic impacts. After we're done with that chunk, we'll do a real quick sort of second chunk on thinking about the ways in which community science work can revolutionize ecological research. And I'll specifically be talking about studying ecological gradients in 
um, what are sort of otherwise difficult to observe characters if you use more traditional approaches. And then in the third, um, sort of the third component of this, we'll talk about using community science and animal behavior research. And here it's really gonna be about studying rare natural history events. And it just so happens that the rare natural history event I'm gonna be talking about is lizard mating behavior. So that's our, that's our plan. We're gonna jump right into this first chunk of using community science to document invasive species. So here's a map that should look familiar with, to most of us here in Southern California. This is the greater Los Angeles region. And I moved here uh, about almost exactly a decade ago to start my position at the Natural History Museum. And you know, one of the things that really just struck me is just the level of urbanization across the greater LA area. And when you think about this region, there's a couple of facts that I think really stand out. One is that there's something around 18.6 million people in the greater Los Angeles region. Um, some estimates are already up to like 18.8, 18.9 million. On top of that, we have the world, or we have the, the country's busiest uh, port in the combined ports of LA and Long Beach. And it depends on year, but LAX varies between being the third and seventh um, most active airport in the world. So as you just think about the number of people moving through this region, the tonnages of goods that are moving in and through this region, you know, the reality is that we have an incredibly high likelihood of non-native species getting introduced to this area. And of course, we have a Mediterranean climate, which means we have something like six months a year with very little to no rain. And that's not particularly inviting for many species, but in urban areas, there's of course a great deal of water dumped on the landscape. And that actually acts to buffer um, sort of that prolonged six months or five months of drought each year, that, kind of, that, that extra irrigation sort of buffers that. So even species that maybe wouldn't be able to thrive here because of that prolonged period of time without water, it's not a problem because they're probably showing up in urbanized areas where they have increased access to water. So again, the expectation here is lots of species, lots of non-native species potentially showing up and getting established. So when I started here um, about a decade ago at the Natural History Museum, this is something that I was thinking a lot about is like, okay, we've got all these potential non-native species showing up, but how do we, how do we possibly study those non-native species or how do we study native species in this region? I mean, if we just zoom in on part of this region, this happens to be just um, just east of the CSU Northridge campus. This is what that neighborhood looks like. I mean, if you imagine, you know, you're trying to document, say, you know, some reptile, some amphibian, um, a slug, a snail, you know, an insect, what are that, whatever it is that you're passionate about, if you're trying to document that in this region, how do you do that when every 10 steps you're on a new piece of private property? How do you do a biodiversity survey in a place that looks like this? And of course, this is the region, the, re, the reason that, that bird studies are so popular in urban ecology research. And it's because you can walk down the sidewalk and you can observe birds because they're moving around. But what if you want to study you know, pretty much any other species? How do you go about, about doing that? And this is where I realized that we needed to stop looking at this as the problem and actually look at this as the solution. And the reason that there's a solution here is because there are, of course, you know, thousands of people living within this shot here. There's millions of people living across the LA region. And all of those people are probably walking around with these devices that we, of course, still, mostly for anachronistic reasons, still call telephones, even though that's not at all probably in the top five things that we're actually using these things for anymore. So we have all these people walking around with these devices that, um, you know, can take a photograph, can upload that photograph to um, to the internet, can upload to a, a particular web platform, and they can actually, you know, all these people in this region can actually be documenting biodiversity. And so this is when I, I started to really think about um, community science as a way to document biodiversity across the LA region. And about eight years ago, I created this project called RASCALS, that stands for Reptiles and Amphibians of Southern California. Um, this is a screenshot of the Rascals project page. This is hosted on the iNaturalist platform. And um, this particular screenshot is just from this morning. We've got over 66,000 observations, over 9,000 people have contributed to this project. Um, and we try to really lower the bar to participation by making it really easy for people to contribute. They can join iNaturalist and contribute observations on that platform. They can also simply email photos to the Natural History Museum. And we have volunteers and staff members and 
work study students who will upload those observations to iNaturalist. Similarly, people can just hashtag nature in LA on their favorite social media platform. And again, our volunteers and staff will find those observations using that, that hashtag, and then they'll upload them to iNaturalist as well. So we try to make it really easy for people to participate. And in fact, that number of 9,063 people who have participated is actually a, a, a huge underestimate because so many observations get uploaded from the museum's account that the number is actually probably something closer to 11,000 people who have actually contributed observations. And I created this project for really two primary reasons. The first reason was that as a curator of a natural history museum, you know, I have all of these specimens available to me um, that allow me to basically jump into a time machine and understand where species were found in the past. And if I want to think about how ranges have possibly shifted in the face of urbanization or in the face of changing wildfire regimes or in the face of, you know, urban heat island effects, um, I need to be able to have some way to get lots of observations of where things are found today. And, and again, the challenge there is, well, how do I get those modern day observations? And so this is why I created this project. And the other main reason I created this project was really to study non-native species. And the goal here, and for this component uh, that I'll be talking about today, is to be using community science approaches to try to identify introduced species soon after they have shown up here in Southern California. And that's something that we call early detection. And the idea is that if you detect them early, you might be able to then initiate a rapid response where you can possibly eradicate that species, prevent that species from getting, that non-native species from getting established, um, ideally before it can cause significant ecological or economic harm. And the other goal here is to also identify some of these common introduction pathways. And if we can identify these common introduction pathways, then maybe we can then take steps to, to mitigate those, those pathways, to try to reduce the likelihood that species are coming in on those pathways, okay? So I'm just gonna give you an example of this. Um, this starts back in spring of 2016. And what happened was an individual who at that time I did not know, um, his, his name is Patrick Gavitt. I didn't know that from his INAT username though. He posted this observation and um, I, I later learned that this is, a, this is his son's basketball hoop that sits sort of on the side of their driveway in front of their house. And this is a little lizard that's hanging out right underneath um, his movable basketball hoop. And when, when I saw this photo, I automatically was like, something is weird about this lizard because this skinks, the, the native skink here in Southern California, it's a thing called, called the Western skink. It doesn't do well in urban places. And I thought, well, it's so weird that this is like around a house. But it turns out that he lives just a few blocks from the San Gabriel Mountains. This is in Glendora. And I thought, well, that's really weird that there'd be a Western skink there. But anyhow, that looks to be what this is. But it bothered me. It still, it just didn't make a ton of sense at the time. Um, but the angle of the photo just, you know, it didn't tell us enough that this wasn't sort of the native skink that you would kind of expect, you know, 200 meters away from his house, you would expect Western skinks to be there. It's just a little bit of a shock that there's one there. And so this kind of was bothering me. You know, I, I sort of remembered this. And over two years later, um, Pat posts another photo. And this is again right around his house. And suddenly there is a lizard that I do not recognize as a native lizard here in Southern California. I quickly realized that this is most likely a thing, um, a skink in the genus Trachelepis, um, which, is a, which is mostly a, at this point, it's, it used to be a really widespread genus. There's been a bunch of taxonomic changes. It's mostly a genus that's now in Africa. Pretty sure this is one of the African um, members of the genus. And um, several people on iNaturalist, just in the iNaturalist community, also thought it was probably uh, Trachelepis. I immediately messaged Pat, and at this point I'd still not met him. And so I messaged him over iNaturalist and said, hey, it'd be great to chat. I think you've got an introduced species. It'd be great to come out and do a survey in your neighborhood. And so about four days after he posted this, I showed up at his house at about 10 a.m. on a Saturday morning and met Pat. And then we went wandering around his neighborhood um, trying to determine whether or not this is in fact a new established species here in Southern California. Um, once I saw, once I was in Pat's neighborhood and, and saw these animals, I was quickly able to determine um, what they were. It's a thing called the African five line skink. It's got an absolutely fantastic Latin name of Trachelepis kinkitaneata. Um, it's a great name to say. It's a really frustrating name to have to write out multiple times in peer reviewed papers, but that's what we do. Um, so we wandered around his neighborhood and saw multiple individuals across 
uh, a whole bunch of different size classes. We saw little juveniles, like you can see there with that little blue tail, that smallest individual on the right there, um, all the way up to these larger individuals that you can see sort of close to the, the thumb there. Um, same larger individual held in the hand in that, in that larger photo that you can see here. This is the juvenile here with that bright blue tail. So after wandering around Pat's neighborhood, it was clear that this was an introduced, um, this was an established population in his neighborhood. So we, we did a bunch of surveys around his neighborhood and documented that they were spread across um, multiple blocks. I'll come back to this slide in, in just a second. But the key point here is that we were able to document this established population. In doing these um, surveys around his neighborhood, we also learned that there was a person who lived in this neighborhood who was a reptile importer, um, breeder, and, and distributor. And so we were able to determine that these actually escaped from this person's facility. And we were really sort of lucky in that um, this person was happy to work with us and actually was able to determine exactly when these showed up. And so we were able to figure out that these lizards had spread to multiple square blocks, even though they had only first shown up about four years ago. Um, so with Pat, I actually worked to then write this up. And there's this wonderful journal called Herpetological Review. And Pat and I actually wrote up um, an article documenting that this species is now established here in Southern California. Um, and so Pat actually got to experience the entirety of the scientific process from that initial observation all the way through to publishing in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. So this paper came out in 2019. Um, and at that particular point, we actually stated in the paper that we were hoping to then try to eradicate them. And so we, and the reason we wanted to eradicate them is that every time we see a diurnal non-native lizard showing up here in Southern California in urban areas, it, it, every time that this has happened, and there's three other species that have done this at multiple sites, they always kick out our two native lizards that are usually in those areas. And so to minimize the chance that we were gonna see that same ecological scenario playing out here in this Glendora neighborhood, and also because it's at the base of the, of the San Gabriel Mountains and we are worried about the impacts they might have if they spread up into the, into the foothills of the San Gabriels, we then worked to eradicate them. We initiated a huge community engagement effort to get access to people's front and backyards. And over the course of three field seasons, we ended up removing um, just over 60 animals um, and it's now been over a year and a half since we have seen any of these African five line skinks cruising around this neighborhood. Um, so the point being here that actually through this early detection as a result of these iNaturalist observations, we were able to initiate a rapid response and keep this non-native species from getting established here in Southern California. So I would love it to be the case that the story I'm telling you now is incredibly rare, like that this that these non-native species aren't showing up on a regular basis. We certainly don't want them to be showing up and getting established on a regular basis. But the sad reality is that that's just not the case. We actually see this really frequently. So I'm gonna show you, and I'm gonna walk you through this table. I know it's a lot to think about um, right off the bat here, but what I'm gonna show you here is this table where I've listed 13 non-native um, reptiles and amphibians that are showing up here in Southern California. So we've got some things like non-native house geckos, Green anole, which you've probably seen, you know, if you've been to a Petco, you've probably seen a green anole for sale there. Brown anole, it's a species that's initially from Cuba, a non-native lizard called a spotted whiptail. Italian wall lizard, so a species that's already very much used to a Mediterranean climate because it's coming from largely from Italy. Um, a thing called the Moorish wall gecko, again, a Mediterranean species from the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, Brahmini blind snake, one of the world's smallest snakes a frog called a coquille frog, and then our African five-line skink. And for each of these 13 species, we're going to document whether or not they've been recorded in these four Southern California counties as a result of these community science efforts. If we documented that species, like if it's like the African five-line skink, and we documented it for the first time in the state of California, then we're going to put a little red SR because it's a state record. Of course, it's also a county record. And I should say that in the case of the African five-line skink, it's only the second time that species has been documented in the United States. There's also an established population in Florida. So red SR for a new state record, CR if it's a new county record. If we knew it was in a particular county, but we've picked up new populations, then we're gonna just put a little plus sign. So our hope is that this table stays mostly blank because we don't want all these non-native species showing up. But 
Unfortunately, here's the reality. Over about the last six years of doing these community science efforts, we've documented five non-native species that had never before been recorded in the state. We've got 23 new county records and a whole bunch of cases where we learned it was in a county and then we picked up additional populations um, on top of the first one that was documented. So unfortunately, this is happening you know, a fair bit. And one thing that's particularly surprising is that in some work that um, my former postdoc and now CSU San Bernardino professor, uh, Bree Putman and I did, we would, we would go door to door in some of these neighborhoods. You know, we'd go out on a Saturday or a Sunday when lots of people are home and we'd, we'd knock on their doors and we'd show them pictures of the lizards that we were interested in, oftentimes green anoles and brown anoles. And we'd ask, hey, when did you move to this neighborhood and when did you first see these lizards? And what we found is that um, for a number of these non-native lizard populations, they'd been established in these neighborhoods for, um, in some cases, over 25 years before the scientific community actually learned about it. And we only learned about it because of things like iNaturalist and these community science platforms um, that allowed people to then report it to scientists like me so that we could then you know, assess what's going on. So um, again, one of the goals here was to also try to identify common um, pathways in which these species are introduced. And these four species that I'm showing here in green are all species that are getting introduced um, through the nursery plant trade. So this little tiny thing, for example, the Brahmini blind snake, another name for it is the flower pot snake. It's a little tiny snake. It's rarely over five inches long. It's about the diameter of a cooked spaghetti noodle. And um, it just hangs out in, in loose soil, mostly eating things like um, ant eggs and pupa or termite eggs and pupa. So it just gets getting moved around in the nursery plant trade. Coquí frogs are coming in on nursery plants from Hawaii. Green anoles and brown anoles are coming in on nursery plant shipments from Hawaii and also from Florida. So we're able to identify some of these common introduction pathways. We also have a lot of species that we've identified through community science, you know, again, observations that people have posted to iNaturalist of species that are, we don't have any evidence that they're established, but we see that they're showing up. And these include fairly big species like Cuban tree frogs, which, which can be up to like three inches long, um, things like gold dust day geckos, you know, brightly colored lizards, um, and a number of other, you know, handful of other species here. Again, not any evidence that they're yet established, but they're certainly showing up. So the bad news, I think, is that we've got numerous non-native species that are being transported into urban environments. In part, this is happening through the nursery trade. And sort of shockingly, this is even true for relatively large organisms like geckos and frogs. So it's not just that you know we're missing really small organisms in the inspections that occur. You know, we're missing like pretty big organisms as well. Um, and some of these are absolutely having ecological and economic consequences. Additionally, these non-native stowaways can establish populations at nurseries and they can get established in greenhouses or get established on nursery grounds where water, for example, is, is relatively accessible. And then once they get good populations established there, nursery shipments are then transporting populations all over the place and setting up these satellite populations as well. That's the bad news. But I think that there really is some good news, which is that you know, these community science efforts largely based upon people running around with their smartphones, um, can provide these occurrence records even from otherwise difficult to access private property. So places that I and other herpetologists, and other biodiversity scientists might not be able to easily access, we can still get data from those places by partnering with members of the community. And in cases of introduced species, this is allowing us to sort of decrease these detection times, identify common pathways of introductions. And in some cases, um, even, even consider opportunities like, you know, early detection and, and rapid response, trying to do something about some of these non-native species. So this is sort of wrapping up the, the first, um, I don't wanna say third, cause the next third is like six slides. So um, this is one of the bigger thirds. Um, so this for this first topic, um, I hope that I have convinced you that community science absolutely is revolutionizing invasive species management. It's completely changing. Um, things like early detection and increasing our ability to mount rapid responses in the case of non-native species that we think are going to have harmful ecological um, or economic consequences. Okay, so if you've made it this far, we're going to jump to this next section. I'm completely changing gears um, in terms of jumping from thinking about the use of community science and conservation research to now thinking about community science in ecological research. And what we're going to be doing here 
is we're going to be studying an ecological gradient in a character that otherwise would be very difficult for, say, one scientist or even a team of scientists to, to observe in large numbers. Okay, so we're going to focus on this ecological research. This is a paper we just published um, almost exactly a year ago. Um, this was with um, my then, um, then postdoc, now professor at CSU San Bernardino, uh, Bree Putman. Um, NG Lee, who is a data scientist um, with Amazon now, and Riley Williams, who was a post, who just finished his undergraduate when he was working with me. Um, and um, one of the what we were what we were focused on here is we were thinking about how predation pressure varies across this incredibly complex habitat that you see, you know, these different diverse habitats that you see across the LA region. So you have places you know, like in the LA basin that are highly urbanized, but then you've got places like the Santa Monica mountains, the, you know, the San Gabriels, the Chino Puente Hills, the Santa Anas, and presumably the predators that things like lizards are experiencing across that region are going to vary greatly. And the lizard that we happen to be thinking about, the species we were in particular thinking about here, is this thing here, the southern alligator lizard. And the photo that I'm showing you here of this particular southern alligator lizard shows um, a southern alligator lizard. He's got his original tail. And then all of a sudden, you can see that the scalation changes. And everything that you see sort of on the other side of my pointer here, that is all a regrown tail. And what we also see in some iNaturalist observations is you can see very obvious ways that predation pressures on lizards are going to likely you know, vary across an urban to rural gradient. And so um, these are two observations, one posted by my, my colleague, Mays Connolly where she happened to find um, this cat that was, was mouthing, although did not actually kill this side blotch lizard. But Mays actually added a comment to her INAD observation that when she managed to get the, this outdoor cat to then drop, you know, to let the lizard go, as soon as the lizard hit the ground, it dropped its tail so that that tail would be flailing around and hopefully distracting the predator, the cat, while the lizard was then able to escape. Of course, she was there, so she made sure that the lizard was able to escape. And here's another observation, again, another cat um, in, a, in an urbanized environment that has found a southern alligator lizard was messing with the southern alligator lizard and caused that lizard to then drop its tail. And so we just started thinking about, you know, there's going to be a lot more outdoor cats in these urban places. There's just going to be different predation pressures when you move from things like, you know, a residential neighborhood up into something like the foothills of the San Gabriels. And so we hypothesize that predation pressure very likely increases with urbanization in these residential neighborhoods simply because there's so many more um, you know, outdoor cats, whether those are owned outdoor cats or feral cats, there's, there's gonna be more outdoor cats. And so there's probably gonna be a higher predation pressure. And we can look, we can use as a proxy for predation, we can use tail loss as this proxy for predation. And this is really common in the herpetological literature. Um, it's not a perfect proxy. Um, you can also think about the fact that, you know, tail loss might also result from inefficient predators. So things that might cause the tail to drop, but might not actually kill the animal. Um, so there's, you know, there's a few assumptions going into this, but it's quite common that we use tail loss as a proxy for predation pressure. So again, our hypothesis is simply that predation pressure is going to increase um, across this gradient. And the reality is, is that if you were interested in doing this, you know, you're a herpetologist, you've got a lab, you know, a handful of folks that can do this. If you went out, you know, on your own, you know, for the peak couple of months of the year when, when alligator lizards are easier to find, which is sort of mid-March to mid-May, you know, you might be able, you know, in, in an urban area, you might be able to get two to three lizards a day, you know, if you spend eight to 10 hours in the field. So if you've got a team of people, you know, maybe you're able to get five, six, seven lizards a day. So it's going to be months to be able to get lots of observations and observations spanning very rural places all the way to very urbanized places. And so what we thought is, you know, we can just use, we can use photos on iNaturalist to, to do this very quickly. And so that's actually what we did. Um, and I'm going to walk you through this next figure. But the key point here is that um, I had a grant that was to do something totally different than this. I had a, I had a grant to fund um, this, this um, postgraduate researcher, uh, Riley Williams, to basically do reptile and amphibian surveys in the Baldwin Hills and along the LA River. And if he finished up early with those surveys and he had like two hours at the end of his day, I would just say, hey, jump onto iNaturalist and try to find photos that show the complete, you know, from the tip of the nose to the tip of whatever the tail is, if it's a broken tail or if it's a regrown tail, just find as many of those photos as you can. And he pulled as many photos as he could that met those criteria 
over a two year period, it was 2016 and 2017 and that's it. And just from doing that, he was able to find 723 observations of Southern alligator lizards. Many of those were adults, which we mark in um, the, uh, the sort of orange dots here. Some of them were juveniles. And all we're showing you here is if, if that lizard had experienced a tail loss event at some point, we're just showing it here as across this sort of one line. If it has never experienced a tail loss event, it's down here on the zero line. Of course, most of the juveniles are gonna be down here because they just you know, haven't been alive all that long. So they haven't encountered that many potential predators. So um, now what we're gonna say is, okay, across varying levels of urbanization from places that are very rural, have 0% impervious surface. Impervious surface just means if rain hits the ground, is it able to go into the ground? If it can't go into the ground, you know, it hit concrete, it hit asphalt, it hit a building roof, um, that's an impervious surface. So um, as you go from very rural places, 0% impervious surface up to places that are like, you know, LAX, right? Acres and acres of, of asphalt and impervious surface, you know, things like commercial districts, warehouse districts, lots of, you know, asphalt and building roofs. So high levels of impervious surface. We're just gonna plot for, adults and juveniles, the, prob the, the probability of them having experienced tail loss across these varying levels of impervious surface. And what we see is of course adults, as we would expect, they've been around longer, they've had more of an opportunity to experience a tail loss event. In very rural places, there's something like 55% of adults have experienced a tail loss event. You get into the most urbanized places and it's more than 20 percentage points higher. You see the same trend in juveniles, obviously lower numbers that have experienced the tail loss event, but you go from, you know, something like 12, 15% in very rural places up to something like 30%. Again, more than, more than a 20 percentage point jump as you move to places with higher levels of urbanization. So it's absolutely consistent with our, with our initial hypothesis. We do see that predation pressure is increasing um, uh, as you move from rural to urban. Uh, areas. But the biggest message I have for you here is actually not sort of the, the ecological result for this particular species. The real message I want to convince you of here is that, you know, Riley sat down at a computer a few hours a week over a four week period of time, pulled together a data set of 723 observations. Um, a data set amenable to statistical analysis, a data set that generated observations across you know, everything from zero to very high levels of impervious surface, a data set that you would not have been able to generate even with a team of field biologists, you know, running around um, across the LA area for multiple years. And we were able to do this sort of in our spare time over a four week um, period to just generate this data set. Um, the point being that there are opportunities on these community science platforms to harvest, you know, huge data sets um, as long as you can come up with sort of interesting questions. So um, this is exactly the, the point that I just made here, simply that community science absolutely is revolutionizing our ability to do ecological research, um, and it allows us to study things that otherwise might be very difficult to observe. All right, we're going to jump to the, the, the last sort of story. Um, it's a little bit longer than the ecological story, but I think it's a pretty fun story. Um, I think you'll be pretty entertained by this. And the idea here is to use these community science approaches to really revolutionize animal behavior research. And um, as I said earlier, what I'm gonna be studying is actually gonna be mating behavior in Southern alligator lizards. You've probably figured out by now, given the ecological study that I'm a big fan of Southern alligator lizards. They happen to be the most widespread lizard across the greater LA area. Um, they actually, because of the increased levels of water available in urban areas. They actually do pretty well, um, even in urbanized places. So you would think, right? I mean, Southern alligator lizards, just so you know, they range from Northern Baja, California, up into um, sort of central Washington. And, you know, across that range, there's, you know, a hundred plus natural history museums, five, you know, major natural history museums. There's dozens of universities. There's you know, a couple hundred professional herpetologists, you would think we must know everything there is to know about sort of the basic natural history of this widespread, relatively common species. So let's just think, what, what do we actually know about their mating behavior? Um, again, the super common species. Well, it turns out there's one paper that even talks about um, their mating behavior in any depth. 
was a paper published by Steve Goldberg in 1972, in which he records um, observations of three lizards, three pairs of lizards that were seen mating. And what that looks like is what you see here on the right. That's the male, um, sort of the lighter brown tan one that is biting the head neck region of the female. She's got more of that kind of olive green and brown tones. So the male is biting the female in the head neck region. They can actually maintain this position for a long period of time. And he just reported in this particular study, he reported three dates at which pairs had been observed in this particular bite hold. And I asked Steve, he's actually a research associate at the Natural History Museum. I said, hey, Steve, like, you know, you saw, you, you, you mentioned these three times that, you know, you'd seen these, like, you know, how did you get, how did you manage to see these? You know, I grew up in California. I had these in my backyard as a kid. I grew up in the Bay Area in San Jose. I had them in my yard. I never saw this mating behavior. I said, you know, how did you actually manage to find this? And he said, oh, no, 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 I didn't find it. I was just talking to my students about this study I was doing. Um, he was actually, he was actually dissecting museum specimens and looking at the histology of the gonads to figure out the, the, time of year in which they're um, reproductively active. He said, oh, I was talking to my students about this and three students happened to observe this, but he'd never seen it. So even in 1972, he's basically using this crowdsourcing, this community science approach to even get the data that he had, but he's, he'd never seen this. And when I talked to him about this a couple of years ago, he still never seen it and I've still never seen it. Um, so I thought, well, can we just crowdsource the study of mating behavior? You know, here we are, we've got 18.6 million people living across this region. Most of them have alligator lizards on their block or they're going places over the course of their day where they might see alligator lizards. You know, can we ask them to pull out their smartphones, digital cameras, take photos of this and, and either upload those to iNaturalist or send us their photos. And so I started doing this work back in 2015 and at the Natural History Museum, we would post a, a big announcement about this. And then um, my colleague in marketing and communications um, Rachel Gertz said, well, Greg, if, if they mate, if their mating season is like, you know, in the spring, why don't you promote this on Valentine's Day? Like, you'll get way more page views. And like, this is one of the wonderful things about working at a natural history museum is that I wasn't going to ever think of that idea of promoting it on Valentine's Day, but I have these experts in informal science education. I have these experts in marketing and communication that are my colleagues, and they can come up with wonderful ideas like this. Now, I wish I could tell you that Rachel wrote this, but no, this um, rather uh, unique writing is mine. This is, um, again, Valentine's Day 2017. Happy Valentine's Day. Love is in the air, but for more species than just Homo sapiens. Well, you might be thinking of roses, chocolates, and a candlelit dinner. Our local alligator lizards are devising their own romantic plans. Valentine's Day happens to be around the start of the alligator lizard breeding season in Southern California, and we need your help to study their breeding biology. And every year we post a blog, a like, you know, oftentimes like this. These were before um, Rachel had the brilliant idea of doing, of doing Valentine's Day announcements. Um, so we had studying lizard love through citizen science, lizard love bites. Um, we've done a, a number more in 2020. Uh, we had to think about sort of promoting the study over the start of the pandemic, which actually um, ends up having some very interesting results. And again, colleagues in marketing and communication, Edgar Chamorro put together a, a great video that you can find on YouTube um, that talks about some of this research as well. So we try to get the message out there. Again, here's the Rascals page. We get lots of observations contributed um, onto the iNaturalist platform. And what's the result of that? Well, the result is that we're getting photos from all over the place. Um, here is a photo of alligator lizards in a bite hold. This is four feet above the ground in some bushes in Valencia. Here's four feet above the ground atop a fence in a backyard in Brea. Right out in the middle of the lawn um, in Los Angeles. Here's a pair on the sidewalk again in Los Angeles. Maybe this is somewhat appropriate in the gutter. Um, this was in LA. I think this might have actually been on the Occidental campus. Um, this is my favorite photo. That's why I use it at the start of this talk. This is a photo by Zan San um, taken in a Pasadena um, apartment courtyard. That's the male there with a the bite hold on the female and another male um, sort of looking on, trying to figure out if he can interrupt the pair and hopefully secure a bite hold himself. Um, yeah, these threesomes actually are surprisingly common. Here's one in Silver Lake. Um, so we can just ask, you know, what do we, what do, what do we know historically, you know, sort of in the entirety of the scientific record, you look across field guides, you look across published papers, what we have is we have three observations. Those three records are only from LA and Orange counties. 
What do we have in seven years of promoting this via community science? I just updated these numbers this morning. They're actually already out of date because I just got one more this evening. Um, so it's 492 records from Southern California. That should now be 493 as of an hour ago. We have 95 records for the Southern alligator lizard in its Northern range. And then there's a closely related species called the Northern alligator lizard that ranges all the way up into um, south Southwestern British Columbia. And we've got 116 records of mating pairs of the Northern alligator lizard. So again, traditional science is giving us three observations. You know, you can't do much with three observations. You're certainly not running in the statistics. You're not going to be making inferences across geographical transects. But what can you do with 587 observations collected over a seven-year period? Well, now we can look at variation across latitude. We can look at variation across elevation. So if we think temperature is really important in driving the timing of their mating behavior, you know, maybe it's going to vary across latitude or across elevation. But also very across years, you know, how does weather affect it? It's particularly been a big issue over the last seven years where we have, you know, really dramatic drought years and we also have some, you know, some better rain years. In urban areas, we can also think about, you know, what's the role that urban heat islands might have in driving sort of changes in their mating behavior. So at this point, um, this is, to my knowledge, this is the largest data set of mating behavior that's ever been generated for a squamate reptile, so for a lizard or a snake. Um, so, and I should just point out, I have still not seen this. I have tried. People have posted things to iNaturalist where I'm like within a 20 minute drive of where their observation was. And I've like driven there to try and see it. And I've not yet been able to see this. And I certainly haven't found it on my own. Um, so even though I've never seen this, I've still managed to pull together this huge data set entirely as a result of crowdsourcing this study. So, um, uh, of course, you know, you can also think about how things might vary um, between the mainland and things like the California Channel Islands. So here it happens to be an observation that was taken um, in Avalon. It was actually in an Avalon backyard um, on Catalina. So what are the kinds of things we can ask? Well, we do see year to year variation. So in dry years, which I'm showing here in the brown text, um, the brown font, we see, um, you know, for the first, you know, four years of the study, if it was a dry year, we usually got between 30 and 35 observations. You all might remember that 2017, was everyone thinks of it as like a really good rain year. It actually wasn't, it was actually just above average, but it just seemed like it was really good after the 2011 to 2016 drought. Um, and in that year, we got three times as many observations. Um, in 2019, again, a, about an average rain year, but it wasn't a drought. And all of a sudden we get about three times as many observations. In 2020, I didn't know what we were gonna expect because we had an incredibly wet December and then a really dry, like record dry January and February. And yet we still got really good numbers. We also had really good rain that year in March. We got really good numbers. In 2021, again, a dry year, um, we had 55. And I should point out that, that the big change, you know, we had this pattern of sort of in wet years, we kind of had three times as many observations in Southern California. That pattern changes with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. We start to see real changes in the way that people are observing um, urban biodiversity. So the numbers kind of change a little bit, but we're still seeing way more observations in wet years than in dry years. I also want to jump back to 2016, really fun weather pattern that year. We had, usually the mating behavior, this mating activity in Southern California starts, it can start as early as the second week of February. We've already had three observations so far this year, but it really picks up in, in mid-March. And so I'm just showing sort of the peak activity here. And what happened is we had a couple weeks of two weeks of peak activity, then a storm came through, then it warmed up and we started to see a little bit more activity and then another storm came through. This is 2016, shut out all the mating behavior down for a week and then start to have more spring-like conditions and they, start, and they start breeding again. So lots of interesting weather patterns. I don't know what to expect in this year. Um, again, we had a wet December, record dry January and February. Um, we'll see what happens in March. But I think because we had a wet December, we'll probably see pretty good numbers because that's what we saw in 2020. So we'll see. But yeah, we wouldn't be able to look at this kind of year to year variation. We wouldn't be able to understand this sort of basic natural history, basic animal behavior about this species without being able to get this giant data set. And animal behaviorists are going to be interested in, you know, basic questions. Like these are standard stuff for animal behaviors to be asking, like what drives the timing of mating activity? Um, it turns out that about 7% of our observations actually involve multiple males um, in a bite hold with a female. And you might think, man, how did I end up in a talk about this? Uh, this is like crazy. 
um, you know, my teacher told me to go to this talk for extra credit, and now I've got some guy telling me about lizard threesomes. Why does this even matter? Well, the reason that this, this really matters is that anybody who's got much of an animal behavior background is going to know that cr crucial, like basic questions in, in sort of animal behavior when it comes to reproduction studies are thinking about things like, um, you know, inter intrasexual selection, so things like male-male combat, and also intersexual selection, which you usually, usually think about as female choice. So if there's multiple males here, what role does female choice have in dictating um, who that female is going to mate with? What role does this male-male competition have um, in dictating who ends up mating? So um, standard questions in the animal behavior literature, nobody was thinking about this stuff prior to having a big data set like this that starts to show us that these um, multiple males competing for one female is actually quite common. We also see lots of variation in where they're mating. About 5% of our observations are in arboreal places. Um, of course, there could be many more arboreal um, settings, but we're probably only getting observations up to about eight feet up in the air. And they could certainly be higher than that. We don't know. But that might cause us to ask, how do courtship behaviors change with habitat type? We also now have four observations of these bite holds lasting more than 48 hours. And so that is immediately going to make an animal behavior say, okay, well, is that what, you know, what's that about? Is that potentially about female choice? Is that the female refusing to mate with a particular male, possibly in hopes that another one, you know, comes by? Is that a female trying to assess, you know, the bite strength of that particular male? So what's going on there? Um, again, we never would have thought about asking any of these questions if we didn't have, you know, these, these data sets that allow us to actually look at how long some of these pairs are staying in this um, in this bite hold. Um, again, yeah, so that's just going to get us to ask mate, mate guarding, or is that, uh, I should also say, yeah, mate guarding is another possibility. That's when the male might be maintained, the male, the, the pair may have already mated, and the male may be maintaining that bite hold just to make sure that no other male comes along and attempts to mate with that female. So we don't know what's going on. Is it mate guarding? Is it female choice? Um, we don't know, but nobody would have ever been asking those sorts of questions. Um, without this kind of a data set. And again, these are standard questions in the animal behavior literature. So um, I hope that this has convinced you, you know, we've generated this data set that's just this huge data set, again, largest data set um, ever generated for squamate mating behavior, um, squamates, again, lizards and snakes. Um, so I absolutely think that, you know, community science has the opportunity to revolutionize animal behavior research. We've generated this huge data set, we're asking all these questions, and I've still never seen this myself. No matter how hard I would have worked um, as a herpetologist, you know, maybe I could have gotten lucky and seen three, four, five um, of these observations, you know, if I was in the right habitat at the right time of year. But now we've got this huge data set, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than whatever, you know, anything's been reported in the literature entirely through these crowdsourcing efforts. So um, I recognize that, you know, it's entirely possible that there are people on this call who are not as, um, you know, who are not as passionate about alligator lizards as I am. So like maybe you're interested in other questions, no problem. Um, these photo vouchered community science projects can allow the study of a variety of natural history events. Um, I'm just assuming everybody's a herpetologist because everybody should be. Um, so here's all these other species that people are making observations of. So things like whiptail lizards, um, there's an observation of mating behavior in that species on iNaturalist. We've got different morphs of California king snakes. Um, this is probably down in San Diego County. Um, we've got things like male-male combat in Southern Pacific rattlesnakes, observations of that showing up. So lots of these rare natural, you know, rare natural history events that suddenly aren't as rare when you've got literally thousands of people potentially out there able to document them. But maybe you're not interested in study mating behavior, no problem. You can also study foraging ecology. Lots of observations of, um, of reptiles and amphibians preying upon various taxa. Maybe you're not interested in foraging ecology specifically, but you're interested in like various predator prey interactions, no problem. Tons of observations of predator prey interactions. We've got various birds of prey here and scrub jays that are taking out um, lizards. Um, the photo in the upper right there is a particularly interesting one. This actually motivated a project that we did over the last two years. That is a non-native spider called the brown widow. That's an invasive species here in Southern California. It's been here in Southern California since about 2003, or was first documented in 2003. And that is a non-native brown widow that has caught a hatchling Southern alligator lizard and has tangled it up in its web and is consuming it. So we actually did a project using crowdsourcing, using community science as a way to document um, 
what brown widows are eating across uh, across Southern California. And this was a project done um, with a colleague of mine, Kat Halsey. So um, just, you know, just to sort of wrap it up here, I hope that I've convinced you that these crowdsourcing approaches, these community science approaches absolutely are revolutionizing the ways that we can do conservation research, the ways that we can do ecological research and the ways that we can do animal behavior research. Um, as I hopefully have made clear, um, this work is not just mine. This work is the result of a huge team of people. Most importantly, that team is the many thousands of community scientists who, you know, just as they go about their day, they pull out their phone, they take observations of the biodiversity that they see all around them um, and upload it to iNaturalist. Um, none of this work would be possible without them. And I'm surrounded by this amazing team of people. We have this wonderful group called the Community Science Office at the Natural History Museum. Um, and they've all had input onto this work. Um, I'm director of this group called the Urban Nature Research Center, where we have multiple um, you know, curators from the Natural History Museum and staff scientists from the museum and postdocs and all these wonderful people who are contributing um, ideas and input and data and um, you know, critiquing projects. And then of course we have wonderful people in like marketing and communications and informal ed that help us to really um, improve the outreach on these projects um, so we can get lots of people involved. Um, and with that, I'm gonna, I'll be happy to take any questions here. So I'm gonna, I'll briefly, well, I'm not gonna, I think I'll stop sharing um, so that I can see some of the questions and I'm happy to take any questions um, about this work. And thanks much for, uh, for joining us on the SCAS Spotlight. Thank you, Dr. Polly. That was an amazing, amazing uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I, I find it really interesting that you, have never seen the mating behavior between those two, two lizards. And, and it just goes to show you the value that uh, the community can add to science by, by doing this. And I'd, I'd like to start off by asking you a question uh, myself. And that is if there's many students on, on, online right now, if they wanted to uh, participate in this community science, is, is, is the app called iNaturalist and, and do they need to create an account? What, what do they need to do in order to do that? Yeah, I actually forgot that my very next slide, if I had shown it, was <laughs> some trainings that we have online. So um, you can go to these, if you just, like if you wanna, if you wanna learn how to do iNaturalist, first of all, like most people who are like under 30 don't need these trainings, they'll just figure it out on their own. Um, those who are good with their smartphones, um, whether you're under 30 or whether you're over 30, but you're good with your smartphones, you don't probably need a training. You'll just figure it out. iNaturalist is a relatively straightforward app to get to get up and running with. But we do. We have created these trainings at the Natural History Museum. Just take a quick screenshot of that so that you can go to those later. Um, the top one there is like just for for everyday users. Um, if it's a family group that wants to get involved, that next link down is probably the best one. Uh, but yeah, iNaturalist is an app that you can. Um, you can use it in a couple of different ways. You can download the app to your smartphone if you have a smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, then you can just use a digital camera. And then you just, once you upload those photos to your computer, you can then log into iNaturalist and, and upload them from your computer to iNaturalist. But it's way easier to do it with a phone because with a phone or, or a digital camera that has a GPS, um, it's GPS enabled. Because what's really nice is that it's not just that there's the photo, right? There's a photo. There's a latitude and longitude that's coming from these GPS enabled devices. Ideally, there is an error rate or an accuracy assessment of that latitude and longitude, and there's a date stamp and a timestamp. And so what's really nice is that what you end up with are these, what we call photo vouchers, right? You have a photograph that somebody can look at 300 years from now and say, yep, that's a Southern alligator lizard, or yep, that's a California ground squirrel. Um, so you have this voucher that's, a, that's you know, tied to a specific locality that's tied to a specific date. Um, so Great. yeah, anybody can do this. Yeah, thank you, Shelly, for asking that. I should have I should have mentioned that during my talk. Yeah, thanks for the information. We have two questions in the Q and A. Um, I'll go ahead and ask you the first one. What were the two native lizards that were being kicked out by the African skink? Yeah. So the two, and this is I should say it's it's not just so in the case of the African five line skink, we actually don't know what ecological impacts it was going to have. We, if we did a study to determine what the ecological impacts were going to be, by the time we had completed that study, it might very well have been 
long enough that we were no longer going to be able to successfully eradicate that population. So we just had to assume that they were going to have the same impacts that we see from other species that we've studied. So the other species we've studied are the, the green anole, the brown anole, and the Italian wall lizard. And all of those have multiple populations across LA, Orange, and San Diego counties. And all of those non-native species, all three of them, in every population we've studied, kicks out our native southern alligator lizard and kicks out the native western fence lizard, which is the one that like a lot of people will call blue belly. It's got the males have the blue throat patch and the, and the blue marks on the abdomen. Um, so they all of these diurnal lizards seem to kick out those non-natives. In the case of the African five-line skink, we just had to assume that it was probably going to have these negative um, ecological impacts. And so we said, we're going to try to eradicate them you know, now, just assuming that this is going to be a bad thing. Um, and we'll never know if we were right about that assumption or not, because we've managed to, to eradicate them. Or at least I hope we'll never know, because if we do find out, it's because another population got established and we didn't get to eradicate it. I don't want that to happen. Um, yeah, so for yeah. sure. All right, thank you. Uh, the second question is, when houses are tented for termites, have you been able to study the effects on alligator lizards? I've seen no. some around recently, um, tented houses that seem lethargic and poisoned. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I don't know of anybody who has done that. And I'll just say that, you know, even broader than the idea of like, of the termites, um, I would say even much more broadly than that for pretty much when we think about toxicology studies and wildlife, there's almost no work done on reptiles. So there are I would certainly imagine that people, you know, if people are putting out rodenticides, yes, that's, you know, we know that that's impacting mountain lions and bobcats and coyotes. We know that the damage that's happening to those animals and their suppressed immune system is causing high, um, you know, high, higher frequencies of mange. But guess what? Those dead or dying rats, those dead or dying squirrels, those dead or dying mice are getting picked off by more than just the big species we study. It's more than just the coyotes, the bobcats, the mountain lions, the red-tailed hawks. It's also gopher snakes, it's rattlesnakes, it's king snakes. And there are, to my knowledge, there are no studies of how those second generation rodenticides are impacting wildlife. And also no studies about that really good question by Lisa um, about things like, you know, what's happening when people are doing like, you know, termite spraying. Or what about people who are just, you know, spraying for, um, you know, fleas and ticks around their pets, um, what impact is that having on some of our, our native um, reptiles? We don't know. Um, I'd also, I would add amphibians into that. We certainly see that things like the garden slender salamander named because it used to be found in gardens across the LA basin and the San Gabriel Valley. Those numbers have totally plummeted. And there's probably a variety of reasons for that, but certainly one of them is probably things like herbicides and pesticides being dumped onto the landscape, which are then leaching into their skin and probably causing declines. But that's just speculation. There's been no studies on any of that and should be, yeah. Wow, that's, that's kind of scary. Um, another question, what inspired you when you were younger to pursue this career? <laughs> um, I think that, I think that when people, you know, I mean, like a standard thing for adults to do is to ask, you know, kids like, oh, what do you want to do when you grow up? And the way that I think about that question is that the actual answer to that question is usually, um, it's just think of it like most of the time, it's just a giant multiple choice question. Like most answers are probably like one of the same 40. And the reality is that there are of course thousands of jobs out there. But you know, when I was growing up, um, you know, Steve Irwin, Crocodile Hunter wasn't on. I didn't even have cable. Uh, you know, there weren't herpetologists on TV. I didn't know that you could be a professional herpetologist until my senior year of college. Also, I still think it's crazy that you can be a professional herpetologist. Like I'm getting paid to basically like study the same lizards I was totally into when I was like seven and eight and, you know, 12. It's great. Um, and the reality is that I, the answer I probably would have given as a kid would have been that I was going to be a veterinarian, except because I knew that you could be a veterinarian. Um, and I really liked animals and it seems like that's what you do if you really liked animals, but I'm allergic to like dogs and cats and rabbits and like all those, you know, hairy dander ridden mammals. Um, and so 
I'm not a veterinarian because of allergies. And then I was just as a, even as a kid, I was really into lizards and snakes and frogs. Um, but I just didn't know you could do this as a career. And I just was super passionate about those and was really into those. And then I just got lucky and found out that you could do that as a career. Um, and so I really put it as like an onus on parents and all adults to like help kids not think of that question of what you want to do um, when you get older. Don't think of that question as like a multiple choice question. Like our job is to like highlight that it's the actual, if it is a multiple choice question, the multiple choices are like, you know, 50,000. So let's think about all that diversity of answers that are out there and, and let people know that there's all these, you know, crazy jobs that people can do. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, suggestions on how to mobilize students in the classroom to join iNaturalist. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I was in, when I was in junior high school, one of the things I had to do was I had to do an insect collection. And, you know, now we're reading about things like the insect apocalypse and um, the idea that anybody should be going out and sort of willy-nilly collecting insects and killing them and pinning them. Um, to me is like when they don't know what those are, you know, you don't know if you're collecting even a, like a federally endangered species. Um, I don't think that there should be those sorts of projects anymore. Not when you can just be walking around. And, and of course, you know, what happens to insect collections? I did one as a kid. I thought I was really cool. I got an A on it. I like was totally into it. I added some more even after the class and I put it under my bed. And then I looked at it three years later and domestic beetles got in there and ate all my insects and the whole thing was destroyed. So what was the value of you know, euthanizing those animals? Whereas we can have people out posting things to iNaturalist, making true you know, data points, and those data points are gonna be around as long as like this digital world that we live in exists. So like between now and the zombie apocalypse, we can all create data. Um, and so I think that those are the kinds of projects that we should be, you know, we should, this should be, you know, there shouldn't be a biology class in the country that doesn't have an iNaturalist based assignment, you know. Um, just introducing people to know that this is something that they can do. I mean, I think about, you know, when you think about like in the face of this global biodiversity crisis, what are the things that you can do? You know, people talk about, oh, like reduce your carbon footprint, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle, um, you know, responsible water use. Well, you know, something else you can do. And it's, it's, you can actually create a biodiversity data legacy. You can, you can yourself create huge numbers of observations that scientists for literally centuries are going to be able to use to study things like how landscape management impacts biodiversity. Um, so anyhow, I just think that this should be in classes as much as possible. Um, you know, iNaturalist has really been around since 2008. Um, it's really, it's growing exponentially. Um, and I just think, yeah, we, we can all be just adding these sorts of, um, you know, having students go out and make 20 observations of absolutely anything. Great. Uh, one last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, one of the skinks that you showed had a blue tail, which, um, which, which uh, why is the tail so brightly uh, colored? Yeah, so lots of people have actually studied this. I mean, it's an obvious question. It's like, these tails are like really amazing. Um, why are they so bright? And people have studied this. And what we usually, and it's, it's, it actually it is one of these cases where like the adaptationist argument seems to hold. Um, and of course you see this in lots of species, right? Like you see, you know, butterflies that have brightly colored like little tails on their wings and things. And one of the arguments, one of the ideas is that that is going to ideally distract a potential predator to things that are not gonna, if they're attacked are not gonna be lethal to the animal. So maybe those bright blue tails distracts a predator, predator goes after the tail oh, well, maybe the lizard loses a tail, which is not great. It absolutely does have ecological repercussions on the lizard, but it's not nearly as significant of an ecological repercussion as being eaten. So yeah, it's basically the idea is distract a predator to something that is not crucial to continuing your life. Um, drop the tail, lose it, that's too bad. You know, you have to put a bunch of resources into it, but you'll grow it back. Um, so that's the idea. That's the basic idea why they have these brightly colored tails. And you'll see in a lot of these species that have brightly colored tails, that's true when they're young. And then when they get bad, they get bigger, they lose over the course of development, they lose that brightly colored tail. And that's because they're gonna then be able to defend themselves in other ways. Or there's fewer predators, you know, you're not, you know, if you're a baby lizard, like everything eats you, it's rough, so. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for that talk. It was really fantastic. Um, we hope everybody enjoyed that. Uh, we will have the recording up um, within the next few days. You'll be able to find that on our SCAS homepage. And then just a reminder for everybody um, who is a member of SCAS or interested in becoming a member, uh, you can find all of our information on scas.nhm.org. And uh, you can also find us or come to our annual meeting um, in May. Um, on uh, May 6. So thank you all and have a wonderful night. Take care.